Sure. Are you know ready or? Uh, no. Why don't we let Why don't we let Bob uh, do the introduction first, and then you can share the screen. He'll let you know when to share the screen. Sure. It takes about a minute for people to come in, so. We are recording, so I think I'll go ahead. And uh, good morning, everyone, and happy new year. It is uh, 2023. We're all hoping that 2023 will be an even better year than 2022, which was somewhat mixed, but uh, we're going gradually back to a more normal uh, circumstances. Um, in terms of uh, things which are coming up, we have the International Congress in Busan in September of this year, 2023. Uh, our own a faculty search for a TEM person will be closing this month and we'll be starting to review the applications. But uh, I'd like to welcome you to, uh, uh, to our series. Uh, the following one will be in uh, beginning of March, the first Monday in March. Uh, we'll skip February, uh, but uh, we have an exciting program today. Our first speaker from Japan, as well as uh, uh, Jürgen. Uh, who's going to uh, give us an interesting talk. So I'll pass it on to Wachu uh, to uh, to make the introductions. Wow, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am very happy today to have uh, Jürgen Pitzko from the Max Bahn Institute of Biochemistry in Martin Street, Germany, to speak to us. Um, Jürgen has a, a very... Uh, uh, deep experience in electron microscopies, where he started his PhD in chemistry in Max Planck Institute for Metals Research in Stuttgart, Germany, and then followed with a brief postdoc experience in the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the Bay Area, California. And then he returned to Germany as a postdoc fellow and rising to the project group leader. And in the last 20 years, uh, Pisco has been uh, pioneering a lot of work in the area of specimen preparations and, and data collections in biological uh, samples, the sample particularly in the kind of the cellular level. So today we are extremely delighted to have him with his work. He actually have uh, run the recognitions uh, a few years ago uh, with an award from the Ernest Ruskes Prize, which is a very prestigious prize in our area uh, in, in Europe. So uh, Jürgen, we are really delighted that you can speak to us today. I look forward to your talk. Go for it. Yeah. Thank you very much Wala, for the introduction. And also to everybody listening, Happy New Year, because we are early in this year. I think this is timely. And now we share the screen and hopefully everybody can see the first slide. So first of all, thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation to speak at the sample DMX seminars, because I think it's uh, absolutely appropriate to bring together the material scientists and the life scientists. As I said, like when we talked in the beginning, uh, beforehand, before we started that seminar today, uh, in former times, since the community was much, much smaller, when we had a lot of discussions between material science and life sciences, that changed because life sciences grew and material sciences grew. And now, 20 years in that field, or more than 20 years into that field, I see that we are beginning to share again and to be together again and to learn from each other. And that's very, very important. And uh, also like the technology I will introduce now, since today's seminar is, a, is split, well, my talk is split in two. So I talk about how the technology came into existence. And then Sven Klumpe is talking about the cutting edge technologies. And uh, because he's at the forefront of developing that technology, I thought it might be appropriate to have my PhD student who is in the final year of finishing his PhD to talk about like the nitty gritties of what sample preparation can do for life sciences. But now, let's see, the subtitle, which I have today is clear. It's about the molecular 
vision into the cell. And you see that in that random slide of a HeLa cell, which is from 2016. You can see it on the left, uh, on the upper left. And uh, you see nuclear pore complexes, the big wheels in this, the purple wheels in this rendered image are 125 di nanometers in diameter. And these are the gates to the nucleus where all the material is shuffled in and out. So these are the gates to the nucleus. And in front of the nucleus, you see, and I explain that also to the material scientists who don't normally see this kind of stuff. You see a lot of these uh, bluish and yellowish particles. And these particles are ribosomes. And these ribosomes are globular. They are 20 nanometers in diameter. And along these ribosomes, you see the red elongated structures, the actin filaments, the cytoskeleton of the cell, which keeps the cell in a shape as human beings. The skeleton keeps the shape of us. Otherwise, we would be a meatball. And, uh, and you see microtubules here depicted in green, where all the transfer in the cell occurs. But you see all in one shot. This is one single tomogram, which we took from a lamella at that time with faceplate assisted technology for the acquisition for tomography, and which made it in a clear high impact publication, just only all together, all the technology brought together to bring forth novel biology in the conjunction. Like the ribosomes are not disentangled like a single particle, but you have them isolated and purified. Here they are at work in their different states and you can analyze them in that single tomogram or in multiple tomograms at a time. But before we step into that FIP technology and in the preparation, I would like to make a step back in time. And since we are a great community, a great round community of our material scientists and life scientists, I thought about like, why not show a movie from the last century, from the 30s? And this is like, the laboratorium für Übermikroskopie. So somebody will, will uh, ask, what is Übermikroskopie? Übermikroskopie is a German word at that time for electron microscopy over, above the resolution of the light microscope. This is the term über, over or above the resolution of the light microscope. And the leader, the director of that lab, in Berlin was a guy termed Helmut Buska. And you see him now walking in, into that laboratory for Uber microscopy. You see like the people sitting in front of the microscopes, you see the people screwing the samples in or screwing up your samples. And what is mostly important here, you see people in white lab coats and you see tiles at the wall. And you might wonder who in will make an electron microscopy laboratory with tiles on the wall where you have the echo and the microscopes are not shielded as we have it nowadays. Uh, and who in the, in the world would wear white lab coats? Well, it looks more like a hospital. And Helmut Ruska, he was a biochemist and a medical doctor. And he was investigating viruses and bacteria. As you can see here in a publication, which his brother, Ernst Ruska, the inventor of the microscope, about bacterien und virus. So bacter bacteria and viruses in the electron microscope, not in the electron microscope, but in the über microscope. So in the above the light microscope. And there is a relation to Martin Sweet and Helmut Ruska, which I will disclose in a couple of minutes. Helmut Ruska is not, not that known in the electron microscopy field nowadays because he died prematurely in 1973. But what is known is his work on bacteria and viruses in electron microscopy. And this is still a foundation which we have. And there's also a link to modern treatment nowadays. That was the past. 
electron microscopy in life sciences. So shortly after the invention of the microscope. And then in 1968, and this was, I, I like to show that slide because also Bois introduced me being a postdoc at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. It's an article by Roger Hart from Science from 1968 about the polytropic montage, which is an analogous of tomography. And in this paper, he used TMV, so tobacco mosaic viruses at 1968 to do tomography, so the hard way. So put the sample into a microscope and tilt the sample, acquire an image at every tilt area, and then do a reconstruction. But he didn't do a reconstruction, he just only did a position of the images, but that was already like a real step forward into 3D electron microscopy. And when you look at the, at the discussion of that science paper, what he stated in that early, early on paper, he stated the polytropic montage could potentially reach the resolution, the best resolution of the microscope, or at least three x That was in 1968. Now we are in 2023, and uh, I have to say, I think the three x we haven't reached yet in tomography, but I will show you, and also Sven will show you, that we can reach resolutions which are already sub-10 angstrom. Okay, but we are, it goes from there and it goes to Martin Sweden. Now I bridge it to almost to nowadays, but you see this very, very famous slide here and a very, very famous chicken on the grill. And that chicken on the grill, like in the 70s and the 80s, there was like a, a, a saying here in Martin Street along the faculty that you are doing fried chicken to, uh, electron microscopy because. The power of the microscope, almost every protein and every cell were, was destroyed under the electron beam. And this is what depicted here in, in that nice little sketch made by uh, Walter Hoppe, one of the directors at that time of the Institute of Egg White and Leather Research. You know, it was then in the 70s turned to biochemistry. And now you can see the shot, the aerial shot of the institute. You see, like on the on the right side, you see the tennis courts, which are very essential because the microscopists at that time they worked always in the dark, and we had the dark rims underneath their eyes. I think the material scientists will understand that. And you see the legacy, which we still have from Hoppe, and that's the so-called Hoppe bunker. In that bunker, it's an area underneath the earth, ten meters below the earth. They already created that in the 70s. So the microscopes are shielded from electromagnetic radiation, uh, sitting on ground stone. So they are completely isolated from vibrations, mechanical vibrations. And still today, we have the perfect specs for even the systems from Thermo Fisher. So this is the legacy which we have, the hobby bunker, and we are residing and at the farthest end of the left corner of that building of the sea wing, we are sitting at the moment together with some people uh, and, helping the and holding the seminar. And in this sea wing, well, I worked like for 20 years with Wolfgang Baumeister, but we have since two, two, two years almost, we have a new director, that's John Briggs, myself as the group for CryoM technology and still Wolfgang's people who are doing together with us, tomography in different respects. And we are doing now with new department with John cell and virus structure. So we are back to uh, where that publication I showed you from Helmut Burska. And I have to say, we have like one scholar still of Helmut Burska, that's Wolfgang Baumeister. So Wolfgang Baumeister, this is PhD with Helmut. And so this is closing the circle to today. So that was a short introduction to the past. But now, what do we have in cryo -ET? We have a lot of hurdles. And I summarize now all the hurdles which we have. And uh, Sven will later on give you the hurdles only for the preparation. 
So to help us out, the samples have to be in a hydrated state. So we have to find means to vitrify the samples and we have to advance by pressure freezing. It didn't change much over the last 30 years. We also have to think about new grid designs to make handling and transfers and tomography much, much more easier and even maybe allow temporal freezing of samples. Like microfluidics should be a topic which we are not talking today, but maybe the next time. We have to have suitable sample thickness. And we all know from material science and life science that sample thickness in electron microscopy is decisive in gaining higher resolutions. So we have to advance the sample preparation, advance FIP milling, advance also the targeting, the 3D correlation. We still have to cope with low contrast due to the weekly scattering objects which we have and the building blocks because we are normally in life sciences dealing with carbonaceous compounds. So carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, weekly scattering elements. And uh, so we are low contrasty. So we have to optimize instrumentation, detectors, face plates. And well, this is intrinsic and we can't change that. We have to get rid of frying the chicken. So meaning we have to cope with the sensitivity to the ionizing radiation. So we need to have low dose methods, automations in place and advance all the acquisition which we have. So let's go to all the samples which we have. Protein and viruses, easy by plunge freezing. Bacteria also, super easy by plunge freezing, but already the diameter of these normal E. coli cells and the range of 500 nanometers. So this is already like top edge and uh, way too thick to do a high resolution. For cells, we do the FIP milling, and I introduce that in a minute. And for tissue and organisms, we have to do the lift up. But depending on the sample, we need to consider high pressure freezing as the option and to get better vitrified ice. So how can we streamline and simplify the workflow? And the workflow we introduced almost 15 years ago, and, uh, and this is like only a sketchy view of this workflow where we have a lot of transfer steps in between vitrification, light microscopy, fit milling, and in the end, the microscopy part. And the microscopy part, we are not talking much today because it's meanwhile such streamlined that you just only push the button and do tomography. However, everything what's up front, this is not push button and we need to work on that. So first of all, let's integrate the light microscope with the fit. That's one of the things which we need to do and which already happened in various stages. Second, so by improving and integrating that, we reduce the number of transfer steps, which is clear effect where we risk to lose our samples or contaminate our samples. Second, we need to improve and advance the method, method and the technology to increase the throughput because we are still very, very slow compared to other applications like in semiconductors. And of course, we have to automate further and to make it more accessible for the users. But what we normally do forget to talk about is about the vitrification. And the vitrification is like the decisive step in all of the things which we are doing. So we have to find means also to monitor the vitrification of our samples. So if it's really vitrified, we normally only see after we have done the preparation, after we have transferred the sample into the electron microscope for the final acquisition of a tomogram. And this has to be clearly changed in the future. So let's go to lamella milling and sample preparation. And what is clear, what, we, what you see in the background, are cells lying on an EM grid, a quantified grid. You see like these holes, which are two micrometers in diameter covered by an ice layer. And you see these big bumps. And these big bumps is are a couple of cells and the area where the nucleus is, this is where the big bump is. And how to approach that? When you look at these holes, they are two micrometers in diameter. These cells are like easily 10 micrometers in thickness. We, you won't get any image out of that. And you will see that in the next 
G, next slide, of a GM image. But what is very, very decisive? The question is, was and is, is how can we really access cellular material? At best, minimal invasive. At best, completely automated. And at best, in a super timely or super fast manner. When you look now at the FIP milling publications and the documents you can find when you, when you look for tomography, for cryotomography, for IMB milling, and of course, Lamelli, then you see over the years from the start in 2006, where Mike Marco published the Nature Methods paper about E. coli being wedge milled. And I'll show you in a minute how wedge milling is done. It increased. But it took a long, long time until it started to get really noted. And also like instrumentation became available so that we can do FIP milling routinely. Now look at that image of these cells I showed you in the SEM overview. You can only see the leading edge of the cell where it's transferred. You can see already some ribosomes, but where the nucleus is, you are not able to see anything because resolution, is dependent on thickness. And in material science, we know that. A couple of other atomic layers, we can get maybe pico resolution, but in life sciences and photography, we need a couple of nanometers and hundreds of nanometers to get a volume and to get like that interaction between the molecules and the organisms. So the idea was in formal times, and it was like back then, 15 years ago, to take that cell, or as it depicted here in that sketch, that act on the sunny side up, and to shoot with ions on it by fit milling, by gallium fit milling, and to make an area accessible with thin enough, homogeneously thin, to do tomography. There were a couple of strategies which we already like introduced into 2010. And the one strategy is, of course, to mill the whole grid. But that will take a long, long time with the gallium beam because the ablation rates are very, very slow. And so you would need weeks until you have a whole three millimeter diameter grid mill. Then there was like that pilot study by Mike Marco where he did a wedge. And at the leading edge of the wedge, you are thin enough, but you're not homogeneously thin, depending on the angle of the milling. And also it was questionable about the radiation damage. And what was done in material science was clear. It was a lift out. You create a lamella and then you lift it out. In 2010, when we did that schematic, I said, lift out will never be possible. However, we approach that differently now to do a lamella. And I show you in that little movie now, I show you, this is from Julio Otters from 2012. You see E. coli crawling around the grids. And then if frozen in in time at liquid nitrogen temperatures on the EM grid. You take that, you place it into the auto grid. That's a reinforcement ring, which we use with the Titan glaciers in optical generation of microscope. You place these rings into a shovel and a shovel is flying into that focus ion beam chamber, which is huge because it was made for semiconductor chips for eight inch wafers. So we, and we are only using three millimeter grid, so it's not quite right, but you shoot or you investigate with the SEM beam to locate the structures, and then you shoot with the gallium beam to ablate the material. Now here depicted like with the wedge here. So that is clear enough. And then you take that grid into the elegant microscope, you transfer it out again, no targeting at that time. And you see that these auto grids, they have like an indent, a slot, so that you can allow shallow milling from shallow angles. And then you take a tomogram that was at that time the idea of dual axis tilting, which is uh, nowadays not really, really pursued. Just so you to increase the information content of the tomogram, but the alignment of the two series and the radiation damage is prohibiting high resolution. Anyhow, that was at that time that we see the chopsticks of a Titan or a Glacius or whatever we have for the world axis tilting. And we came across we, which with the idea that so you to use a cell and see one cell on the left 
cut open from the top, cut open from the bottom, and the sketch on the right, you see, you see a freestanding lamella, and this is depicted in that little animation here, because sometimes it's easy, it's hard to understand what you see here. So you cut a pattern from the top with the gallium beam, you cut from the bottom, and you have a 100 or 200 nanometer thick lamella, freestanding, no support film anymore for doing tomography. Here you can see that an example on Chlamydomonas, an algae, a green algae. You see that algae is pretty big, a colony on the left side, and a cut open, an opening window on the right. And when you look at it in the TEM, you already can assign in that non-stained image, non-stained lamella, the ultrastructure of that little algae, which is half plant and half animal. So it has a chloroplast where you can do photosynthesis. You see these various types of ultrastructure in that, and of course you can do on that lamella tomography, which we did in various aspects. And you can see that in that little movie, that's the degradation compartment at the ERM membrane. And we assigned a couple of these molecules. I just simply picked the three ribosomes, the ER bound ribosomes, and the CDC 40 a plus the proteasome. And you see that where the proteasome and the CD48 is, it's the devoid of ribosomes. But the resolutions are not that high. So 18 to almost 40 or 35 angstroms, but it's still enough to do the interpretation, the biology interpretation, which we need. So we are not aiming at being atomic resolution, we are aiming at starting to do the interpretation on conformational states and on activity of these different molecules in conjunction. So in 19, we thought about doing lift out, which I said in 2010 might be not possible. So you see just a sketch in the background. And the idea was, and you see that is a movie made by Oda who is just joined, did join the seminar here, live in Martin Street. You see that little movie where the idea was to take a gripper and to lift out material out of a bulky specimen and place that material in a second grid, like in material science, in a slot grid, to do further milling and then to eventually do tomorrow. A very delicate process, a lot of transfers and a lot of movement of that gripper arm to make it work. That was the idea, but it took some time to develop. And now, Biofib lift out the biopsy. They look at the C. elegans, which is 50 micron in diameter, hundreds, several hundreds of microns lengths sometimes. And you would like to get a shot on the molecular structures. So, first of all, you need to try to locate the structures. That means you need correlative light microscopy. And you see where the gut region is, you see where the embryo is in that fluorescent light microscopy image, which was done offline. And then you do high pressure freezing on that specimen. And then you have that big planchet and you have to locate that C. elegans organism. And of course, everybody can see the C. elegans in that image, no. But if you do, and if you forward that movie, you can clearly see in the fluorescence microscopy image where C. elegans is. And then you can dig in these areas and lift out a very, very small, a tiny, tiny volume out of that planchette of that high pressure frozen device. You place it into this lot grid, which we modified a little bit because our sections, lift out sections, are much smaller than the material science sections. And then in the end, you thin further until you get electron transparency. You see that little crack at the, at the far end of that lamelli, and that you will see in the next slide in the TEM overview again. And we took a couple of tomograms, and we were astonished about the quality. You can see that movie, you see the ribosomes, you see even COP1 and COP2 coated particles. You see a lot of structures, which you, which you just only analyze partially, 
But what was fascinating is we just only took the ribosomes in different parts of that organisms out of these tomograms, which we took only five, and we analyzed their conformational states. And we found out that they have distinct states at a resolution of 15 angstroms about approximately. Or when we go back, or when we go forward, we meanwhile have in yeast lamellae sub five angstrom resolution, which you can see here, which we have put out on bioarchives already with uh, a method development with platinum coated lamellae, where we increase the resolution and stabilize the stuff. And we just revisit now what Roger Hart postulated that we can reach this tomography with the polytropic montage, three angstrom, we are almost there. But is this technology widely used in the community and is ready for liftoff? I would say not really. So what needs to be done? And the second part of this talk, I give the word to Sven, as I already introduced Sven, last year's PhD student in my group. And he will tell you a lot about the route to molecular stories of 1,001 tomograms and how to get there in a timely fashion. And I give the word to Sven, and afterwards we can discuss whatever we do. Hey, just quickly. So Jürgen asked me, first of all, no, also from my side, Jürgen asked me to give a little bit of a more practical point into all of these things. So um, let's jump right in as the hurdles in sample preparation, as you already mentioned, are um, the success rate of bunch and high pressure freezing, sample preparation of thick materials by cryo lift out and or plasma ion sources. And we'll slightly touch on that uh, targeting of where you wanna go in your thick tissues by um, correlative microscopy using either fluorescence or scanning electron microscopy and finding the throughput that we need to tackle new biological questions and we'll mainly focus on the um, last three uh, in the second part. And one sentence summary of this is that um, we believe that technological advances in the high level of automation are essential for high throughput standard workflows, as well as development of new techniques to tackle new biological questions. And first of all, I want to go into the technological advances that have been going on in our lab uh, in recent years. And one of those is in-chamber fluorescence light microscopes, where there's a bunch of examples already in the community, for example, the PyScope by the DeMarco Lab, but also Meteor and IFLM as, as commercial products. And we've been mainly developing or um, co-testing the Dalmic Meteor system here on site. And what that gives you in terms of information is that during lamella preparation, where you can see here on the top left, one of these little clumps of cells, you can actually double check um, by the fluorescence microscope, whether your target of interest is still inside the lamella, as long as it's fluorescently tagged, whether fluorophore or GFP um, or any other tag protein. And then during lamella preparation, you can actually go through these and double check whether you milled away your feature of interest or not. And even in the final lamella, even though the background here, as you can see from the cells around it, is uh, pretty high, you can still crank up the histogram to really see that the feature of interest uh, that you were targeting is still inside the lamella. And just as a, a side note on the technical notes here, this was a 40X um, 0.8 NA objective. And then you can go into the TEM and really um, correlate these two images uh, with each other and basically guide your data collection based on that fluorescence image. And we'll see how this comes in handy in thick tissue preparations as well. In this case, we target the end compartment um, a biological feature. Now, the reason why we want to do to thick tissues is that there's so many, many biological specimens that we cannot handle um, in cryo-electron tomography simply we, because we don't have the tools. And as Jürgen already mentioned, we will need to go to high pressure freezing in that sense to get from a tomogram or a tilt series on the left with a lot of bright reflections um, by plunge freezing to uh, the vitreous state of water, as you can see on the right. And as Jürgen already mentioned, we do this by high pressure freezing, which basically embeds our sample, in this case, a drosophila um, ovarial, 
inside a thick layer of tissue, uh, of ice, sorry, of which was the frozen ice. And what we've recently then done um, via this gripper method again is to extract larger volumes to um, be able to address the targeting problem by scanning electron microscopy. And what we did here is then to use redeposition, as you can see these little micro welds patterns here on the right side uh, of the structure to attach these little chunks to the side of the half moon grid. And then we can zoom in onto these um, extracted materials to take slices off with the fire focus ion beam and then take an SEM image of the exposed area. And this way you can really endpoint your structures inside the volume. So we'll zoom in onto the uh, volume here. And then what we're gonna see is that on the top right, there is a cell where um, all of these have a lot of these black dots, which are lipid droplets, a high contrast uh, in scanning electron microscopy. So you have one cell here on the top right, you have one cell on the bottom right and one cell on the left. And you can really see the regions in between the cells that we targeted here actually, um, stained by, um, for the cytoskeleton, and we can then end the SEM data acquisition at a certain point, create our final lamella and zoom in onto this wherever we wanted to go for data collection, in this case, in between the, the extracellular region. And then we see really these actin structures, uh, these little filaments that you see um, pushing holes into the membrane. Now, this was already a way to target inside tissues, but what we then, um, when to conceptualize was series sections with the cryo lift out approach, where you take larger volumes even and slice these up into several lamellae. And this is what you're gonna see in the next video, where we again have a C. elegans worm embedded here and seen by fluorescence microscopy. And then we take a needle approach where we put a little copper block as an adapter to it, use fit milling again for redeposition attachment of this cryo block to the needle. And then we can cut loose this large chunk, which basically incorporates almost the entire C. elegans worm, move over to another receiver grid that in this case was a normal grid where we milled out several um, grid bars. And then we can really like off of a slight um, loaf of bread, take slices off of this by redeposition attachment of the chunk, as you can see here appearing now, and then slicing off um, the lamella. And we can do this several times iterating to get almost serious sections from uh, at cryo lift out um, resolution. And what you end up with then is a lot of these lamellae that eventually make it to the TM, even though contamination is still a big problem in this preparation, you can zoom in onto this and already in the overview, you will see morphological features of the cross section of this worm where you can assign things like the body wall muscle, the pharynx, nuclei. And when you take tomograms of these then, you can really see, for example, in the body wall muscle case, um, here, actin filaments as these uh, little dark spots, as well as myosin heads. And as always, we can trace these in order to um, do our biological analysis on the samples. Now, the other thing is that with the integrated light microscope, what you can then do is guide your data collection by a fluorescent spot inside your tissue. And here just shown for a phase separated compartment, which would never be able to target by scanning electron microscopy, simply because you don't get any contrast for it. And this then allows you to um, target features just like the nuclear envelope inside um, the drosophila egg chamber. And again, um, showing that these are really packed and um, quite specific for the germline nucleus. Now, the other thing that I really uh, want to talk about is the high level of automation that we need. And we uh, underwent this endeavor by developing a software picture which is called Serifib that basically allows you to do all of the workflows that we've seen so far. So lamella preparation, volume imaging, as well as correlative approaches. And does this in a way that you can talk to the FIPSIM hardware via a driver that can be switched out for different um, vendors even. And we've developed so far the, the Thermo Fisher um, driver for these instruments. And at least from the feedback, uh, it's been used quite a bit in the community. And we are also 
um, continuing to develop the software package for other en endeavors. And one of these endeavors is machine learning in Cryofib. So what we did was to take fluorescence, uh, sorry, to take FIB images that we segmented manually and trained a unit model <coughs> to differentiate, differentiate um, to do segment segmentation of the grid bars as well as cellular material. And then on the microscope, on the fly, we can use those models to guide lamella preparation without any user intervention. So we have our original image, we get this unit segmentation from that image, we can use a grid library to um, find out the orientation of the grid bars. We can then use the cellular segmentation to find instances where we ha would have enough cells to support a lamella. We choose positions based on this um, shown in as little black squares. And then finally, um, filter those against the grid bar segmentation to get our final lamella positions. And the way this would look like on a real microscope um, is that on the top left, let me just go back. On the top left, we would have the SEM view. On the top right, the FIB view. And on the bottom right, a little camera inside the chamber. And what we're going to do, oh, what we're going to do is basically move to the correct position um, for depositing a protective layer of GIS platinum inside the chamber, as you can see here, this little needle coming in. And then we screen the grid and the instrument without any user intervention, uh, sample in sample our workflow will decide for positions to create these lamellae, as you can see here on the top right. And just a bunch of these examples, as you can see here, but the, the main um, development that we then still need is we need to be able to put the sample in and out of the scope automatically. And the Rosalind Franklin Institute in collaboration with Thermo Fisher actually, came up with the so-called Arctis system where we have an autoloader um, combined with an electron column, a fluorescence microscope, and a plasma um, focused ion beam inside a single instrument. And this allows us really to go through 12 grids with this workflow um, without any user intervention and still prepare lamellae of cells inside these 12 grids. And we have one of the prototypes here in the basement, and this is what it looks like. Um, on the left, it's still in the factory, so we have a smaller chamber than the, the usual models. Um, and on the right now, the, the fancy, shiny um, thing. And the main difference of going from gallium-based liquid metal ion sources to xenon-based, as the material scientists have um, done more recently um, quite a bit, is that we have different shapes of beams. So basically, at lower currents, the xenon beam is less focused than the gallium beam, while at higher currents, the effect is inversed. However, still, um, and this has been uh, characterized quite a bit, however, still, we can use the um, gallium-based model that we did on the algae that you saw in Jürgen's part of the talk uh, and deploy it on yeast cells using xenon beam milling and still get from that model um, lamellae out. And these lamellae are quite decent uh, in, in thickness, I would say as well, uh, ranging from something like 100 nanometers to 300 nanometers. And the in intriguing idea then is that you could create a generalized model for um, cellular preparation. And what we're aiming at in this is a human in the loop type of machine learning for cryofib, where you go, um, on the scope, really going through the workflow with more standardized models and then being able to retrain the models while the data is being or the lamellae are being prepared. Uh, and with that, I would like to end and um, thank Jürgen and Martin Beck um, for the great experience uh, as a PhD student, and we'll be happy to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Susan, and also Jürgen, for this outstanding progress in the last few years to make this thing impossible become possible. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, so in view of time, uh, I would suggest that we will wait till uh, the six, second speaker speak, and then uh, at 9.30, we will uh, continue the Q&A session. So could you two stay online?
and then I will now send back uh, uh, to to Bob. Yeah, thank thank you, Wari. Yeah, I think I agree. Um, thank you both for this uh, wonderful presentation, and uh, we're also trying our best for cryo. Uh, Feb as well for uh, different purposes, but uh, definitely it's uh, the way of the future and uh, trying to get better and better resolution. So I'll like to uh, introduce Professor Yi Che, who will uh, introduce our speaker from Japan. Uh, and it's really appreciated that uh, Yuichi uh, joins us. It's uh, now close to 2 a.m. in the morning in Tokyo. And so he's uh, really uh, gone out of his uh, way to, uh, to help us and to join us today. Thanks, uh, Yi, please. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Happy New Year to everybody. Well, Yogan just gave this beautiful talk. It's just incredible development. Um, <laughs> now, now let me invite uh, Yoichi um, Akuhara from University of Tokyo to give us the talk. Let me do a very brief introduction. Yoichi is a professor in the University of Tokyo. He's currently the president of the Japanese Society of Microscopy. Well, he's known for his research of using advanced TM techniques uh, to study lithium compound. That's something I'm very passion, passionate about for the reason of lithium ion batteries, as well as in situ work on the deformation mechanism. I mean, he has done a lot of other works as well. I think without further ado, uh, and uh, further ado, and uh, let's welcome uh, Yoichi uh, to give the uh, presentation. Are you ready? Please go yes. ahead. Okay, thank you very much for a kind of introduction, Professor Kui. And uh, I really, uh, just a moment, I need to share my slide. Can you see slide? Yes. Yes, can you go to slideshow, please? Okay, okay. Anyway, so thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, in, a nice uh, symposium. DMX symposium. Now, the in Tokyo Times, as uh, Bob told, two <laughs> in the morning. So I'm a little sleepy, but <laughs> I, I will do my best. The title uh, is uh, just a moment. Green boundary and surface atomic structures. Can you see my slide? Both. Uh, no, I think you you just exit the slide uh, mode, uh, the presentation, and uh, can you reshare? You can't see my slide. Uh, no, I cannot. You cannot. What happened? Just a moment. You got to share now. Now yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you for you are inviting me. And uh, uh, my name is Ikuhara from University of Tokyo, and the operators on this project from University of Tokyo, and uh, also. Uh, Yuichi, please go to presentation mode. This is presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. Good. And uh, the main contributor is Dr. Sasano and uh, Dr. Kobayashi. Uh, who mainly contributed to the present work. So, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. As you know, the oxide are fundamental materials for rich marine batteries. Iron ore being rich in cobalt oxide, LLT is very important, rich in battery related crystals. And the lattice defect in the crystal uh, and their surfaces are strongly related to materials properties. Therefore, investigating the rats defect is very important to further improvement of rich wine battery crystals. This shows a schematic of a surface, just a moment, surface and the interface of iron origin for rich battery. The origin is used for cathode 
and the graphing and mode. And during the charging, this charging, which is deleted to form uh, the deleted interface. Yeah. I just uh, use this laser pointer. This is deleted interface, okay? And the surface is here. Therefore, surface and deleted interface structure is very important to understand the mechanism of the charging, discharging uh, phenomena. Uh, we apply the, the hard stem and ABF stem imaging technique to characterize these materials. You are know, you know, you are, you are most of you are the electron microscopist and hard if image is very powerful. This is a, a geometry of hard if and if uh, uh, de detectors. The samples here and hard if is utilized for highly scattered electrons. And in this case, this is a hard if image of iron orbin structure. You can clearly see the heavy atoms like iron and phosphor like that. So hard of some image is very powerful to see heavy atoms. But you can't observe the light elements like lithium and oxygen. But in 2009, we developed a new technique that is ABF, annular bright field imaging technique. Now this technique, you, you utilize a low risk scattered electron here, ABF image. Therefore, this is that bright field. Therefore, contrast is inverse. But uh, you can see all of atomic current position here. This is atomic structures. This is overlapped with the ABF image. You can even see lithium ion site here and oxygen ion site here. So you can see our light elements in this imaging conditions. We use uh, simultaneously use this technique to characterize our lithium uh, ion uh, battery crystals. We first apply the half uh, hard stem image to characterize ion olivine. This is 2008. Uh, observed from A axis. In, the, in that uh, days, we only see the framework which is consists of iron and the phosphor like that. The, the structure is here. So the, this is a, a, this uh, uh, this purple color correspond to the lithium crumbs. You can't see the lithium which must be located in the center of this frame framework, but you can see at the time. But as I told you, in 2009, we developed, we developed a new technique, ABF imaging technique. Then we applied this technique to directly observe lithium ion uh, crowns. We applied the lithium cobalt oxide. This is the structures. And this large red circle corresponds to oxygen crowns and yellow lithium crowns like that. And we observed from this direction, that is one one bar to all direction. This is thus obtained ABF image you can clearly see the uh, lithium contrast, lithium crumb contrast, which is indicated by these arrows. This is, a, I think the, this is the first direct observation of lithium crumbs in a lithium uh, ion related crystals. And uh, this is a uh, demonstration. This is ion olivine, and this is deleted olivine. That therefore has a FEPO4, ABF image, and the bottom is a hard if image. Hard if image, that the uh, framework is not so big difference. But in the ABF image, you can see in the ABF image, you see the lithium crumbs like that, as indicated by this arrow. But after deletion, that contrast di disappear like that. So this is very powerful to directly see the interface between uh, olivine, olivine and the deleted olivine. We applied this technique to characterize this. You, you can even see the hydrogen. Hydrogen crumb. This is a ethylene hydride, which has a trigonal structure. This is a structure of uh, uh, ethylene hydride. In the hard image, you only see hexagonal structure of uh, ethylene crumb like that. You can't see the hydrogen, but in the AB image, you can clearly see the hydrogen crumb, which is the center of this ethylene uh, ethylene crumb like that. Ethylene uh, hexagonal structure like this. So this is a very powerful technique. You can even combine with uh, EDS and EDS. EDS is energy dispersed spectroscopy. EDS is electron energy spectroscopy. You can obtain the atomic resolution chemical mapping. This is an example of obtained for ABF NVO. This is a, a EDS mapping of NVL. And this is a lantern L mapping like that. This is a composite chemical mapping, NV plus lantern. You can clearly see the modulated structure. You can directly see the, such kind of chemical com 
composition distribution at the atomic resolution. This is a very powerful technique. So we combine this with ABF image to characterize the rich ion uh, related crystals. Okay, first I will show the surface structures of the orbit. That is 0, 1, 0 surface of ion orbit. This surface is very important. Uh, this is, I, I have already shown this schematic. As I told you, there is stated interface is very important. And this sample, the surface, 0, 1, 0 surface, that is B surface is very important because lithium, which is in, indicated by green uh, color, uh, is mig rich migration is known to occur perpendicularly, one dimensionally parallel to B axis. And therefore, this surface plane, 0, 1, 0 surface plane is very important for understanding lithium ion exchange. So we observe this surface from uh, cross-sectional direction. We prepare the ion origin single crystals, and this is the 0, 1, 0 surface. We cleaved this surface and immediately protected this surface uh, by uh, epoxy. And the free surface is observed from the uh, cross-sectional direction directly. This is thus obtained with image, this surface. Epoxy is covered this surface like that. This is a magnified image of ABF image. You can see atomically flat surface can be seen. This is profile imaging. And this indicates that uh, the, the surface has a low energy and high stability. So you can see all of atoms, including lithium, oxygen, and everything. And in order to see the, uh, this atom more clearly, the contrast is inverted to make each atom position clearer to see surface structures. Uh, therefore, this is ABF image, not hard image. So you can see the surface very clearly. And we magnified this region, this magnified image. You can see the relaxed structure. That is actually surface relaxation occurs. So you can see this one. We actually uh, calculate the relaxation uh, behavior by using a uh, First principle calculations, I will show you later. But you can see the oxygen column, phosphor, ion can be clearly seen on the, on the outermost layers. And in addition to this, you can see lithium double columns like that. You can see all the atoms. And this is a, a result calculated for surface relaxed structures by first principle calculation. In this case, we use the BASP code. Uh, I don't have the time, I'm not going to explain in detail, but surface is actually relaxed because it's, even there's rich in vacancy, uh, that the phosphor is sifted and uh, uh, sifted to this direction. So the, I'm not sure. So this is sift and this relaxation uh, is consistent with this result. I'm not going to explain this de detail. And uh, we then delicate it. Uh, from the surface, which is extracted by using a NVO sift, NVO, this one, I can't see this one, NOBF4 liquid. So this is, uh, and therefore, which is delicated from the therefore, therefore, FEPO4 is produced. Because that's mismatching because between FEPO4 and the LA FEPO4 is different, therefore, cracking is occurred like that. So diffraction pattern obtained from here indicate also two phases coexisted. But it is interesting, if you look at the surface structures, after two weeks, the, uh, this FEPO4 is changed to LYFEPO4. This is recovered. That means, and also crack uh, healing occurs. This means that lithium diffuse from inside to the surface like that. The selected area pattern around here shows uh, this is a single phase like that. So that is uh, even at room temperature, lithium diffusion occur from inside to surface. So we tried to uh, map lithium concentration. This is yields obtained from FEPO4 and LYFEPO4. You can see there, are, there is a very big alpha peak, which is located in the FEPO4, which appears in the FEPO4 profiles in the lowest regions. This is a magnified uh, profiles. So it has been reported that the intensity of this alpha peak has a relationship of FE balance states. 
we utilize this equation, this regression C. And you can see this equation. Therefore, the lithium concentration map can be obtained. This is thus obtained lithium concentration map. This is the AD system image. And in the surface area, FEPO4. And inside every FEPO4, you can see it's uh, almost one. But uh, it is interesting that there is an intermediate phase between FEPO4 and LIFEPO4. We, we uh, measure the diffraction pattern from intermediate phases. This is the diffraction pattern. The surface structure inside this pattern corresponds to the LIFEPO4. The surface, this is FEPO4. And uh, in the, this intermediate phase, three and four, you can see in addition to fundamental spot, you can see very small spot. This is come from the intermediate phases. And we tried to uh, analyze this diffraction pattern and found this is uh, uh, correspond to the FE, the tube two third FEPO hole, like that. And uh, uh, Professor Yamada of uh, University of Tokyo uh, artificially uh, synthesized uh, lithium 3 sat uh, FEPO4 like that, and uh, and uh, uh, he obtained the diffraction pattern like that. And this small spot, satellite spot, is correspond to the uh, uh, is consistent with our spots. Like this spot, then we can determine that intermediate phase was lithium 2 sat FEPO4. Uh, this is a lithium constant map again. So this is a, a intermediate phase and the diffusion occur from inside to the surface. And it is interesting that in the diffusion front, uh, you can see facet structure is formed like that. It's a facet, is parallel to low index plane. Therefore, the diffusion occur this way in the front facet is formed. And uh, the, this facet is uh, diffused to the surface and this intermediate phase is dragged. This is actually a phenomenon of lithium uh, diffusion. And my student was very patient. He observed this region after 11 hours to almost half half a year later. So that in the, in the half a year later, 400, 200 hours, lithium uh, FEPO uh, is completely recovered. So this lithium is diffused out like that. So 11 hour to uh, 4,200, he made a movie. Bob, can you see this movie? Okay. Okay, this is a uh, lithium is diffused from inside to the surface, first B direction and then A direction. A direction is a little slow, but we can see this is a, a dynamic observation, although this is very slow diffusion phenomenon. Okay, let me show the second topic is the brain bundle. This is also very important. LLTO, electrode, we used. And uh, we characterize the grain boundary resistivity from the viewpoint of the grain boundary characters. So this is LLTO, double purpose sky structure. This has a double purpose sky structures, lantern rich layer, lantern poor layers, uh, alternatively stacked along the C axis. This is a polycrystal uh, sample of the LLTO. And uh, from the cold call plot, uh, it has been reported that uh, uh, <clears throat> conductivity in the bulk is much larger than the uh, grain boundary conductivity. And therefore, it is important to understand the origin of grain boundary resistivity. Okay. So, in the case of polycrystalline materials, it's important that grain boundary has a very different grain boundary character. Their properties and the structures are dependent on the grain boundary character. This is very important. Grain band character means a misorientation angle between two adjacent crystals and also grain band plane. Therefore, in order to understand the effect of uh, grain band structures and, and uh, material property, we need to consider the grain band character. Then we use the same grain band characters to compare the structure and the property. That is the important point. I just briefly show uh, introduce uh, CSL. What is CSL? Coincidence site rats models. So this is a grain and grain. If well, grain one and grain two is overlapped with a misorientation angle zero degree, 
there is no grain band. In this case, we call this sigma one. If grain two is rotated for about by 15 degrees, uh, so this uh, random grain band is formed. But if you rotate it, for example, this crystal is by 38.2 degrees, so this blue atoms and the red atoms coins, uh, is overlapped. This magnified uh, image, so blue and the red uh, atoms are matched to form a supercell. This is so-called coincident site values. And similar values can be defined by the volume of the CSL, CSL divided by the volume of unit cell. Therefore, when the sigma number is small, this means that coherent, the, that the boundary is very coherent, okay? In the actual materials, there are many uh, boundaries which have different sigma values. Today, time is limited. We just pick up uh, two type of grain boundary, sigma five coherent boundary and the sigma 13 boundary, which the sigma number is larger than sigma five. Maybe there are corresponds to the general boundary to reveal the origin of grain boundary resistivity. Okay. If we look at the grain boundary in the polypropylene material, it's very difficult to determine the atomic structures because one of the grains, for example, don't axis, but usually the other is inclined. Therefore, we fabricate the bicrystal, where they find the sample precisely controls the misorientation angle and the grain boundary frame. I'm going to explain how to make bicrystal later. And we also uh, apply the electrochemical string microscopy. This is so-called ESM. And this is uh, the, uh, similar to AFM uh, microscopes. And when this is cheap, when you apply the plus voltage, the chim ion is diffused from the surface to the inside. If you apply it minus voltage, Lithium ions diffuse from inside to surface. In this case, a concave surface is appeared. And in this case, convex surface appeared. Therefore, we can detect the local ion, lithium ion conductivity. This is a very interesting method. This is a case of polypropylene materials. You can see most of boundary has a low conductivity, but some boundary, which is indicated by this uh, black arrow, this is actually sigma five, is our conductivity is almost similar to comparing with the grain interior. So this is a very powerful technique to see the local ion conductivity. Okay, so uh, in this study, we fabricate bicrystals and we apply the ESM technique. And again, we apply the stem imaging technique to characterize atomic resolution characterization. And the uh, uh, KPFM, this is Kelvin probe host microscopy also is applied to uh, investigate the surface electric potential. We use uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, procedures. Okay, uh, let me uh, introduce how to make a sample preparation. So LLTO, we can't obtain the single crystal of LLTO. This is very difficult. Then we first uh, use a strontium titanate by crystal by using hot pressing. This is easy to make this pipe. We use this uh, as substrate for LLTO growth. We put the LLTO thin film by using the pulse laser deposition. And uh, the film homing condition is, uh, is here. It's shown here, 800 degrees C. And uh, this is the collaboration with Professor Ota Group in Hokkaido University. And we fabricate the sigma five boundary, the missing triangle angle is 36.9 degree, and also sigma 13 grain boundary, the missing rotation angle 22.6 degree. Same rotation angle as sigma five, but lower coincidence than sigma five. Then it is very interesting to compare the structure and the properties between these boundaries. Well, this is the topography of the sigma five and the sigma 13 grain boundary. And this is the ESM conductivity. And this is the ESM profiles, conductivity profiles across X, Y direction, like that. As you can see, as a, the sigma five boundary, the conductivity of the grain boundary is almost similar to grain interior. But uh, the conductivity in the sigma 31 grain boundary is uh, decreased compared with uh, uh, grain interior in this way. 
much uh, decreased like that. So lithium ion is hard to diffuse along with this sigma 13 gram batteries. This is a KPFM potential. Sigma 5, there's no charge along with XY direction, but sigma 13 boundary, this is positively charged. This is positively charged like that. And the uh, charge density can be expressed by this very simple equation, Poisson equation. So this phi is uh, electric potential, rho r charge density. This is very roughly, if this is a uh, uh, electric potential, charge density is probably rough, uh, follow this shape like, like that. So this is positively charged and negatively charged. I'll discuss this, please remember these profiles. Okay, then go to the atomic structure characterization. So this is the hardest image of sigma five grain bundle. You can see, see the uh, bright uh, crumbs as a layer. This is a lantern rich layers, and this is a lantern poor layers, and the lantern rich layers are alternately located and uh, home the grain boundary. And the structure in it is zigzag manner like that. Like that. This is a magnified image of the grain boundary structures, hard image, heavy image. You can see uh, the bright spot is always center of the structure in it. This is a chemical map, Eves element, atomic resolution chemical map. In the center, we can determine this is lantern, this is lantern. In the corner of this structure in it, this is a titanium all crowns like that. And in addition to that, if you look at the AB image, you can see the very uh, thin crumb rate, crumb contrast. This corresponds to the oxygen. Therefore, we can uh, make this structure is something like that, this way. In the structure unit, one crumb of lantern is, uh, is located, and in the corner, titan is located here. So we can determine this very, very, this very complicated structure from the atomic uh, scale. Then we measure the uh, yields from this region, green bundle region and the bulk region, oxygen KH yields. So there is no so much difference. This means that, that uh, uh, there is no formation of oxygen vacancy as a green boundaries. We also uh, investigate the titanium L3 yields. So green is a green boundary from green boundary, black is from bulk. So there is no big difference. That means that no reduction of the titanium focus. So if we look at the structures here again, you see the titanium. Titanium has a, a octahedral structure here with oxygen. And all, all of the titanium has an octahedral, octahedral structure. That means a, a six coordination numbers. So uh, then, the, the, then uh, the structure is very similar to the bulk. That is consistent with uh, no charge curves along with the grain boundary. This is the case of sigma five grain boundaries. On the other hand, what's happened for sigma 13 grain boundaries? So as again, we can see lantern rich layers and the lantern poor layer, lantern rich poor, uh, rich layer, poor layer are alternatively uh, stuck like that. And the forms are this kind of structure in it of sigma 13 grain boundaries. This magnified of the sigma certain grain boundary is a little bit different because not so clearly the structure is not clearly imaged. That means a distortion occurs inside the structure in it. Every image is similar. And this is elements. The, the green interior, you can directly see the location of atoms, in, but inside the structure in it, that is not, uh, um, the structure itself is ambiguous. But you, you can uh, roughly estimate it. This is a uh, uh, two lantern. This is one lantern. So the structure is something like that. And the, the structure inside is uh, different between two structures like that. It's, it's, this is very complicated, but I think that the structure is similar to that. Then we again uh, investigate the yields of oxygen cage. And the, from the grain boundary and the bulk. If we look at the grain boundary, this is bottom field compared to the grain bulk structure. That means that large amount of oxygen vacancies must be introduced at around the grain boundaries. 
We also put a, a measure the titanium LC3H when binary bulk. And this is a little bit chemical shift occurred. It's very different from the case from, of the sigma five binaries. This indicates that partial reduction of titanium four plus occurred. That means the three, titanium three plus is included. And the structure is like that. And we again put the octahedron. This green uh, octahedron is also distributed. But in addition to this, you can see uh, the triangle uh, structure is formed around uh, titanium. So that is the coordination number of this structure is different. Uh, probably the coordination number is five. This octahedron is, octahedron is six. So this is because the formation of oxygen vacancy and the titanium three, titanium three plus is uh, um, formed. So uh, we need to consider charge compensation, compensation because a lot of books and vacancy is introduced. Maybe the charge balance is needed. And uh, there's a possibility of reaching vacancy, random vacancy, and titanium vacancy. I'm, I'm going to talk about this later. And uh, we estimate the uh, titanium balance, is, uh, balance. Usually, we use a uh, multiple linear least square fitting. This is we can uh, uh, separate, divide the two, two peaks like that. But to this time, we apply the non-negative matrix uh, functionalization, MF method, because we have a lot of uh, spectrum and uh, uh, from each pixel, so we can divide it, the TI, TI four spectrum and TI three spectrum by this method. This is thus obtained NFM decomposition spectrum for titanium four plus, and this is titanium three plus. By using this MFM decomposition profiles, we can make a titanium balance map like that. This is a uh, bright is plus four, uh, dark is plus 3.3, .3, and we can roughly estimate that the green boundary titanium balance state is plus 3.7. So in the bulk is 4.0. Therefore, the, about 30% of the titanium 4 plus is reduced at sigma 13 grain boundaries. Again, I show that this is, uh, uh, as I told you, from this profile, oxygen KH. So this indicates that the large amount of oxygen vacancy is introduced. And this uh, uh, titanium L3 uh, chemical 50 indicates that titanium 3 plus is included, partially included. And the, the, uh, the distribution of charge defect is in this way. And in the core regions, the oxygen vacancy is introduced. And this uh, minus charge regions, uh, what's, what, what is the main vacancies? So th this is again, the uh, conductivity of the grain boundaries I showed you. In this case, conductivity is reduced like that. Then uh, lithium vacancy is increased and therefore the lithium ion concentration must be reduced uh, and, uh, and therefore lithium ion conductivity is reduced. Uh, so therefore, uh, the lithium ion depression induces the grain boundary rigidity. So I will like summarize my talk. Uh, the, I, today I show the two examples. One is surface structure characterization of the origin, ion origin structures, and found that surface structure is reconstructed. And uh, uh, the lithium ion diffusion occur from uh, uh, inside to the surface, forming the faceted diffusion front with metastable intermediate phase. This is the lithium two third FEPO hole, and the lithium migration is observed predominantly one dimensionally parallel to the B axis. <laughs> For the grain boundary characterization for LLTO, we apply the CSL theory to compare with the sigma 5 and the sigma 13 grain boundary. And uh, uh, we found that chemical bonding and the lithium conductivity of sigma 5 are similar to those of grain interior. And oxygen vacancy and the lithium uh, vacancy are accumulated around the sigma 13 grain boundary, resulting in the decrease of lithium conductivity around grain boundary. And I would like to thank my colleagues. And I have a three portion at the University of Tokyo groups and uh, the Japan Foreign Stem Center where we're located in Nagoya and the uh, World Plenary Institute at Tohoku University. I appreciate the our collaborators. And in Tokyo, we are established the uh, microscopy uh, center. We have uh, about 20 transmission microscopes in our laboratory 
including ablation corrected atomic resolution TN stem, analytical TN, high voltage, and in situ high contrast and bios soft materials in the same building. I think this is the largest center in Japan and perhaps were comparable to uh, the Yuri, I'm not sure. But if you come to Tokyo, please visit our laboratory. I will show our laboratory and discuss about the uh, microscopy uh, researches. Oh, thank you very much for your kind uh, attention. Well, Yo Yoichi, thank you very much for a uh, very impressive talk. Uh, your lithium imaging, lithium ion imaging is just very impressive as well as proton. Um, let me ask a few questions that maybe we can also loop in the uh, Yogan uh, uh, later. Um, Yoichi, the first question is related to your lithium ion phosphate. You see once you delithiate lithium, uh, mm -hmm. forming iron phosphate, you start to have this crack, uh, yes. this beautiful crack, right? All aligned for formation, right? There's actually two questions related to that. Um, so one question is, is there a size effect? If it looks like, you know, looking at the scale bar, right? You have this uh, relatively large, lateral size, large piece of lithium ion phosphate. Uh, if you go down to the smaller size, do you still see the crack formation? Uh, yes, this is a very important question. And I think this crack formation, of course, depends on the size of the particles. This is, we use a very, very flat and single crystal surface. Therefore, the crack is uh, uh, periodically, almost periodically located, but the distance between this is the order of 100 nanometer. But uh, if the particle size is small, like uh, 100 nanometer or something, even deliciated, the strain itself is uh, not so large and the crack will not occur. I think this phenomenon depends on the size of the uh, particle. Yeah, I think that's why looking at this uh, crack formation, uh, the uh, uh, semi-periodic, looks like 200 nanometer, it looks like if it's below 200 nanometer, maybe harder mm -hmm. to crack to form. And also this crack formation is uh, all parallel there, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, is it the, do, is the analysis, what's that plane, a crystalline plane get cracked open? Uh, this is uh, this is actually B plane, B plane. Therefore, uh, this one, B, I need the, Yeah, this is a, a B plane, B a zero one zero plane, and the, yeah. and this is a zero, zero one zero one zero zero plane, the parallel to zero one zero zero plane. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So parallel to one zero zero plane. Yeah. yeah. This is yeah. I think this is a, a kind of a cleavage plane. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. Um. Second question is related to your uh, the, the second topic you talk about. Also beautiful as well, LL, uh, uh, TO. Um, you image figure out is the surface lithium concentration. Uh, at the green boundary concentration, that's reduced, leading to the reduced ionic conductivity. I think the correlation is there. Uh, and in addition to that, is there a speculation because of this oxygen vacancy and lithium vacancy form, right? So the surface bonding is changing. So in addition to lithium concentration, is there a diffusion barrier of lithium at the gray boundary that could be different can also lead to a lower lithium ion conductivity? I think this is a difficult question. In this case, uh, uh, we just measure the diffusion along the green boundaries. This is the certain bound, certain one. Diffusion along the green boundaries. Mm -hmm. but the, the question is the diffusion across the green boundary, right? Oh, and my question is, uh, uh, in addition to the lithium concentration, because at the green boundary, the bonding is also changing due to oxygen vacancy and the uh, energy barrier for lithium diffusion along the green boundary is there a possibility that's also changing to just yes. the energy barrier yeah yeah, yeah. okay no, i think so yeah. Yeah. yeah 
Okay, so, okay, good. I think for the time consideration, maybe we should come to a panel discussion. We still have a few minutes. Uh, uh, Bob and, and Vaad, do you want to ask uh, uh, questions? Let me just ask a couple of quick uh, practical questions to uh, Yuichi and then mm -hmm. pass it over to Wa to, in, to uh, bring uh, Jürgen uh, into the discussion. So uh, the two quick questions I have is uh, with the first one with the ABF imaging, Mm -hmm. uh, how many scans uh, can you do uh, to and retain the same uh, pictures, the same images? How many scans? How many scans? Yes. Is every is the hundred scan uh, the same as the first scan, or is there is there yes, damage? Is there, yeah, I think that depending on the materials, but in this case, uh, not so much. Maybe five or six scans. Okay. Thank you. But sample and is very stable. One, Maybe one scan is okay, but this is very sensitive. Therefore, the uh, the electron dose is uh, low. We use a uh, six, seven picoampere. So, right. So we have to do it very carefully. Yeah. The other question was about the um, the second topic. Uh, how did you for those beautiful images? How did you remove the STO substrate? How did you obtain the this substrate? How did you make the specimen to remove the STO substrate? This is just a uh, hot joint. We yes, have but uh, you have pictures of the of the thin film grown on it. So you have to remove the substrate to take those beautiful pictures. How do you remove the substrate? Remove. Oh, OK. Uh, no, in this case, for structural characterization, we just polish it from the bottom to the surface. And the ion seeing is conducted from the bottom. Then we can characterize the uh, uh, atomic structures. So for, we don't need to to remove whole of the uh, this substrate to measure just the surface and the okay. ESM method is also just even STO is attached there's no effect so okay so it's it's just classical classical uh, polishing and and iron milling that's the right that's classical. yes okay thank you so let's uh, hand it over to to Wa back to Wa please okay good there's a question from Lester uh Saruzak and to um to uh professor ikuhara and his question is what is the yachan beam energy was used in the haadf and abf lithium imaging and was the imaging done at the room temperature or liquid nitrogen temperature <coughs> this is just the room temperature Okay, good. We just observe the standard uh, room temperatures. Okay. And the voltage? Voltage 200 kb. 100 kb? No, 200. 200, 200. kb. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Uh, I'd like to uh, open the floor questions to uh, Bo Jurgen and Sven. And uh, if you have any questions, you could write it on the QA. And we will read out the questions and they will answer it. Uh, uh, Yochi, could you uh, stop sharing your screen? Screen, you can see this, right? No, uh, yeah, no, we do see the slide, but I think you you may stop uh, sharing your slide. I right yeah, I miss. Okay, okay. Put slide, right? No, you can stop sharing it. So we can have some questions to the first speaker, right? Okay, uh, Jürgen, I have some questions. Uh, could you put up one of your slides in the workflow? One of the slides in your workflow? Yeah, maybe the, the last slide or so. So there's a lot of steps involved in the whole process. Uh, a general question that I like to raise is, what are the time limiting steps or the human effort limiting steps in the entire workflow after you you put uh, after you put your tissue in the vitrified state? Yeah. You mean that one? Well, yeah, let me see. I Is that that one you you mean? Yeah, right, right. What are the rate limiting steps? At the moment, all the rate limiting steps are in upfront, like 
between vitrification and in the end tomography where we identify that the sample is not vitrified or not homogeneously vitrified or heterogeneously vitrified. This is weight limiting. And second, the pip milling itself, since we are now using both like gallium and plasma, and gallium is, uh, I would say, like for normal cellular samples, we are in a range of 20 to 30 minutes per lamella. And for the plasma fib, for tissue, I think we are in the same range. But for the tissue samples, where you have to do the trench milling, depending on what kind of iron you are using, you are slower or faster. And, and that would be a question Bob Glazer normally asks, how much damage do you cause when you do this type of milling? So how far your ions penetrate your samples and also the molecules you are in, you would like to then to investigate in the end. So weight limiting at the moment, I would see tomography, definitely the acquisition not. I don't see, uh, this is a personal opinion, but uh, I don't see that we, the, the fast tilt tomography, which we have uh, seen at the West Coast a couple of times, uh, I think we can gain a lot if this works, also in focus, also for high resolution. But at the moment, it's only for the overview. For the general one where you focus, I see this is not weight limited. Absolutely not. This is automated more or less. It's the targeting of the structures and the pre-preparation before you put it into the fit mill. These are the rate limiting steps. Uh, Sven, maybe you can comment and add on if you want. So, yeah, I would agree that in principle, especially for cellular samples, I think we are there um, also with um, recent developments by in the lab of Rado Steen Dana, for example, where we can uh, focus only once and collect multiple tomograms per focusing area. So basically pushing tomography data acquisition speed quite a bit, but in terms of really getting that uh, perfect sample of the biological feature that you want inside the TEM, that's the rate limiting step, I would, I would say. Yeah. And uh, I can okay. direct, and uh, well, I see directly the question Nestor uh, has with the gallium. Mm -hmm. The gallium contamination, I can, uh, first of all, uh, we check gallium contamination, but we couldn't detect with the EDX detector, which we had not on site, but off site. Um, so we couldn't see, but in the images, you see gallium contamination, which sometimes also enhances the contrast and makes it easier for aligning the tilts of the tomography series. <laughs> but how deep the gallium is going, we only can estimate at the moment. And at the moment, since we are milling from shallow angles, that's in the range of six to eight degrees. I would see it like in the range of five nanometers or more. Sven. So the only thing I can tell you this is the Z-dependent B factor plot, where you take basically ribosomes, for example, in a certain volume of your tomogram, and then average those and look at how many ribosomes you need to reach a certain resolution. This experiment has not been done yet. I know that there is a supplementary figure in a recent bioarchive by the Rosalind Franklin Institute, where they have first indications that yes, there is damage. And for them, they took the ribosomes that are 30 nanometers away from the sample surface and still saw effect in terms of defect. However, very explicitly, this experiment hasn't been done to, to the best of my knowledge. But I have to say, to add on, is uh, that we are working on such a plot. So uh, we would really would like to see, because we know that when you, when you hit the sample with gallium, like for example in silicon, you can reach up to 70 nanometers where you damage the material. And 
We would like to know how far we damage our molecular structures when we use gallium, xenon, argon, or whatever. And that, that's the reason why we are working on that plot so that maybe in a couple of months we can show something like this. Okay, that's very good. Maybe I can, I want to ask another upstream questions. The one on purple, uh, which is the vitrification steps. Uh, you point out some of the cell are fully vitrified, some of them are partially vitrified. So do you think there will be space now to be think about the fishing apparatus? namely the high pressure fishing apparatus that we buy commercially. So you think there's space for them to improve on, on that? Because if we can't get your specimen piece of well to start with, uh, that's also make this technology uh, uh, hit and miss. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I think especially in the assembly of the high pressure freezer where you have Basically, your planchette, that's very manual work. You add your sample, you close the sandwich, and then send it to the high-pressure freezer. This hasn't changed in 60 years. And I think this is the main point where really I see improvements can be even easily done. Because, I mean, we don't have necessarily the throughput that the plastic community has in terms of just throwing away a sample if it's not vitreous. Um, because our sample preparation just takes way longer and it's more cumbersome. We cannot work at room temperature. So I think there's a major improvement that can be done on that instrument. And also like rethinking like the process of freezing in fast, uh, not long, oh, the plunge freezing process, but it's like, as I mentioned a little bit like about grid design and microfluidics, maybe there are approaches where we can freeze even thick material in a fast manner and um with the new devices microtechnology offices so uh but this is way too premature to talk about it we are working on some proof of principle studies uh but i guess uh that has to wait for maybe one or two years from now yeah i think this is an area between the biologists and the material science can converge because lots of uh, uh, abiotic materials also want to keep in a pristine state, which is also important to freeze it uh, in such a way that uh, the samples are, are, are in its native conformation. So I think you know, it will be probably warrant some more discussions uh, among the biologists and material science and also the nanoscientists as well. I mean, this is, a space that I think we should uh, foster. I I totally agree, and uh, Nesta, Nesta's comments were very relevant as well uh, to both uh, both aspects. Yeah. Um, so there is a question from the audience that um, there's a difference in the sharpness of the beams between the gallium and plasma. Can you discuss the fall of the beam intensity? So, yeah, um, maybe I can comment yeah. on that. Basically, in, in the liquid metal ion source, right, and the material scientists will be way more proficient in this than I am, but still, you get the tailor cone that extracts your ions, right? And this means that your virtual source from the beginning is actually quite small, around the size of 50 nanometers. And this is why um, you can focus that beam very precisely at low currents, while in the high currents, the aberrations of the system um, make your beam very broad in a sense, and therefore the density is not as confined anymore. For the plasma source, it's different because you have an aperture where uh, the ions are shooting out of the plasma chamber and you get a virtual source size of around 10-ish microns and therefore at the lower currents you have a very um, non-sharp beam meaning that even your images become very blurry the depth of focus gets worse well at high currents you can actually still with for example xenon or argon get a very nicely um, focused beam and therefore also remove material more in a more focused matter. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you.
I also like to raise the questions about assessments of the damage uh, at the end of the game. Uh, so why now we take this uh, reductionist approach, we assume all the protein of target should, should pertains certain conformations. So, but the problem I see is you don't get on a high resolution, doesn't mean your sample are no good because that's how biology does, you know, they move around, they flexible and that would limit your resolution. So I'm still puzzling in my mind, how do we really measure the ground truth? I can say at a certain depth of the ribosome of all the American machine, you don't get the resolution in the PDB. I'm not sure we can infer that is really a damage problem or that's exactly those ribosome in that regions undergo certain, certain functional activity that they are maybe become, become denaturing stage or phase separation stage or what have you. So I find that the kind of difficult to make such a kind of assessment uh, in general. I don't Absolutely, know what... Ron. They are completely right. This, uh, I, at the moment, we are thinking about like how to make a validation of our experiments, which we are doing in tomography. But uh, except for what already Sven and what I what I have emphasized that we are working on such a B factor plot for the thickness dependent uh, structural information uh, which we can gain. We have no, at the moment, no way of determining how far we alter the structures by the way we do the preparation. Since we never reached resolutions in a range where these alterations would make a mark because we always ex were in, in former times, we were in a range of 10 to 20 angstroms and uh, it was not, it was beyond our dreams that we would see conformations um, in the range of five to seven angstroms. And if you can go below five angstroms and this radiation damage probably should really be something which is very, very critical to study. But uh, of course, at the moment it's only exempts where we have five angstroms for the ribosome, for example, and a little bit less than five. Uh, but I guess in the future, we have to see how to validate our experiments more critically in terms of radiation damage, definitely. Yeah, Maybe I, kind of like, I kind of like to turn the questions around. You see, I like to look at your chicken barbecue again, which I enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> you are still in the fried chicken area. <laughs> okay, so my question is, as a biologist, maybe important to distinguish between the chicken and the duck. Okay, maybe not too important to understand the detail of the chicken. So I think that is an area that I think we all kind of engage in looking at the detail of the chicken, but I think the biology, who cares, is the, a meat is the meat, you know, you go to Bavarian, you know, you eat meat, okay, it's a chicken and duck and sausage, they, they all taste good, right? So, and, <laughs> and uh, so my question is, maybe we need to kind of two track, in other words, uh, for the audience that who may be just care, are you, doing a, a, a meaty thing or, or a fish, you know, between the animal, well, fish is an, also animal, sorry. But anyway, uh, between a poultry and, and then also, also a fish. So um, I think that maybe something would be worth thinking about uh, in, in that round. I mean, that would, I think that would also require technology also because you get a sausage, but they may be a vegetarian sausage, you know, fake sausage. So, uh, <laughs> so that's a lot of interesting thing we need to think about. Just a comment. Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd like to taste the gallium in it either. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we have a catch up, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I think we uh, 
but we uh, i think the uh, many people are moving on to uh, to uh, their own meetings uh, separately now so uh, perhaps why you could say final word for, for jürgen okay and i think this is a phenomenon uh, lectures by both speakers today and i thoroughly enjoy it and i hope the audience will enjoy it and i think if you have any questions uh you can uh write to the speakers directly uh the emails is posted on our website and uh we definitely like to see you in a couple of months from now great thank you and uh thank you uh the the, the two lads in germany <laughs> and uh and yuichi in uh, the middle of the night in tokyo and I think I'll see you at the I Am Nano workshop uh, in June, which you are organizing uh, in conjunction with the Japan Society uh, meeting. So uh, we'll look forward to that. And of course, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the hoping everyone can gather again at the international meeting in Korea in uh, September, when we'll see old friends for the first time uh, for quite a few years. But thank you, everyone, for one for wonderful talks, really brilliant to start the year 2023. And uh, our students, Raphael and uh, Yi Che, for helping uh, put this together. Thank you, Wa. It's great to see you again as well. Okay. Goodbye, yeah. everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.